Okay, um, I would like to start the next session, which is named um, Antipathogen Predictive and Treatment Approaches. Um, thank you for returning after lunch. The first speaker will be uh, Professor Adi Stern from the Faculty of Life Sciences. Please, Adi. Right, okay. Um, so first I'm gonna quickly apologize. At the end of this talk, I have to run because I'm giving basically the same talk <laughs> as a school seminar um, at 2.15. Um, so my apologies for kind of um, missing the rest of the, of the session here, which really looks promising. Um, and so I'm gonna be telling you today how we use big sequencing data to identify chronic SARS coronavirus 2 infections and hopefully to predict emerging variants. And I'll begin with a brief introduction, although I'm really sure um, you all know, all know these details and, and, and kind of different other talks have already given me the benefit of, of giving this introduction. But nevertheless, RNA, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 has an RNA genome, approximately 30,000 bases. We have the layout of the different genes here, and I'm actually not going to be talking about most of these genes. Um, but I will be talking about one gene, the gene that encodes a spike in pink, and that's the color coding that will um, um, uh, be in the rest of this presentation. The spike encodes the spike protein. And in particular, there's one region which has uh, generated a lot of interest in this protein, which is what's called the RBD, the receptor binding domain. Okay, so um, we see it here. The receptor binding domain is what is responsible for the interaction with the ACE2 receptor. That's what allows the virus to enter our cells and infect them. And in parallel, this is actually the region that is most targeted by antibodies, by our immune system. And so as an anecdote, I'll just say that at the beginning of this pandemic, um, a, lot of, a lot of structural biologists and evolutionary biologists predicted that the virus would not be able to evade the immune response because if there would be a mutation that allowed the virus to evade the, the antibodies, then the, the virus would not be able to enter the cells. Uh, but and unfortunately, um, when there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and the virus has mutated extensively also at the RBD, RBD as we will see also um, in this talk. Um, right. So we all know of the variants of concern, okay? So uh, they're, they're formally called variants of concern by WHA, the World Health Organization. And these are alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and omicron. Um, these are variants that kind of, we had these successive waves, right, that where one variant replaced another variant. And from an evolutionary point of view, uh, what is unique about these variants is they all have a lot of mutations, more than what is expected based on the rate of um, mutation accumulation, the rate of what's called the evolutionary rate of the virus. And so when the alpha variant first came out, um, it, had, it had more mutations than anything else that was circulating at the time. There were simply more mutations. And not only that, the distribution of mutations in these variants is, um, is kind of tilted. Uh, the majority of mutations are non-synonymous, so mutations that affect the, the, the protein. Um, and about 50%, and sometimes more than 50%, of the mutations are in the spike protein, despite the fact that the spike gene itself is, is, less, um, is a lot less than 50% than of the genome. Okay, so we have this tilted distribution. This is what Omicron BA1 looks like. It's off the charts. You can see the region that's boxed, that's the region that is the spike protein mutations. And you can see that there are a lot of mutations in uh, the spike protein. Um, and so the hypothesis actually came up when the alpha variant came out first, is that these variants of concern, which I abbreviate as VOCs, okay, VOCs, variants of concern, um, emerged in chronically infected individuals where there are strong selection pressures, uh, possibly due to treatments. Um, um, so these patients are treated either with monoclonal antibodies or with plasma uh, from convalescent patients um, or because of their own partially functioning, uh, because of partially functioning immune system of the chronically infected individuals. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and because of the large vi uh, viral population sizes. And again, I'll elaborate on this in a minute. But let's first define what are chronic infections. So chronic infections with SARS coronavirus 2 are defined as um, infections which are prolonged, um, so more than 21 days, where there's active viral replication, okay, where the virus is constantly replicating 
In fact, most of the cases that, uh, that we look at are months till the, the longest case that has re been reported today is over a year of someone that is chronically infected with the virus. This is not to be um, confused with long COVID, okay? This is not long COVID. In long COVID, we have systems that, um, symptoms that persist, but there's no active viral replication. And, and all these chronic infections, we actually have evidence for the virus actually continuing to replicate in these patients. All of the cases that have been found to date are from patients that are severely immunocompromised. There is some defect in the uh, immune system of these patients, uh, almost always in the adaptive immune system. Uh, the majority are actually hematologic cancer patients, so leukemia or lymphoma, transplant patients, uh, since these are patients which are treated with, um, uh, with drugs that suppress the immune system, AIDS, which by definition, okay, so not, not all HIV, but those that progress to AIDS and have immune deficiency are also at risk. Um, and autoimmune disease, again, for the same reason, because they are treated with immunosuppressive drugs. Um, some of these patients, okay, so just before I say about these, some of these patients, I'll just say that, okay, so, so the idea is that, and this, again, really makes sense. So in these severely immunocompromised individuals where the um, um, immune system is not strong enough to clear the virus, okay, and so in the vast majority of cases, we have immune systems that eventually clear the virus, and that's it, right? And we've heard about the antibody response and how, anti and, um, um, how our B cells persist and so on. But in these patients, the antibody response is not strong enough, okay? Some of these patients exhibit rapid evolution and antibody escape. Um, some don't. We actually think that it kind of has to do with a balance of how, how much immune pressure there is left um, in these individuals. But I, I won't be talking about that too much today. So first, I'll just tell you about our previous work. And in our previous work, we characterized a cohort of 27 such patients, because this was very the, relatively early on in the pandemic. Um, six of, this is actually a meta-analysis where we uh, gathered together a whole lot of different um, case reports. So we had very in-depth data here about every patient, what the background condition, what treatments they received, and the genome sequence of the virus. Um, six of these patients we, we sequenced, the last six ones here are ones that we sequenced and followed together. Um, this is a collaboration with Ichilov, um, with uh, wonderful medical staff there, Yal Pagan and Susie Myers. Um, and, and so we had all this information about these chronic infections. And again, because of lack of time, I won't really be getting into depth about what we found here. But I'll just say that when we look at all the mutations that we found in these 27 chronic infections, and we compare them Two, variants of concern, the mutations that define these variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and Omicron, um, we see a very similar pattern, okay? So the x-axis is the genome here. The y-axis is the number of events. Events are number of mutations that we see. And you can clearly see that the pink region, right? We have a, these very large bars here in the pink region. This is the spike gene. And so what we found is that spike mutations are enriched for both in chronic infections and in variants of concern, we literally see the same mutations, okay? So mutation 501, we see here and we see here, mutation 484, we see here, and so on and so forth. But one of the interesting findings was that some critical variant of concern mutations were absent in our chronic set, okay? So you can see these two bars here. These are mutations that we see in variants of concern, but we literally never saw them in chronic infections. Some of these were actually very famous mutations that were absent in our chronic infection. Why were they famous? Because these were mutations that were found in other studies to promote transmissibility, okay? So basically what we found is that in the chronic infections, we don't see mutations promoting transmissibility because from the viral point of view, the virus is very happy. It's found a host where it can replicate and replicate and replicate. And there's not necessarily selection for a mutation that will allow transmissibility. So basically what we found that in chronic infections, the virus is less transmissible. In fact, in, out of more than 100 case reports to date, there were only two transmission events detected. And usually this is like an isolated transmission event. They infected one or two or three people and that was it. Uh, what we found in the study is that the virus migrates to the lungs. And when the virus migrates to the lungs in these chronically infected individuals, the virus is less transmissible, okay? The virus is most transmissible when it's present in our upper airways and then we transmit very easily. When it's in the lungs and only in the lungs, it's less transmissible. Okay, so this is a key point, um, and, and 
again, we have to remember that one in a thousand or maybe in a million events, we do get a virus that is very, very transmissible and presumably that's how variants of concern emerged, okay? And one under, I don't know, one out of a million of these chronic infections, but most of them are, are not transmissible. So now moving on from what we call small to big data. Um, and so the caveats of the previous study was that we worked on 27 um, case studies. It was a very small sample size. All of them were what we called old sequences. They were wild type or alpha variant. And we really wanted to go bigger. Um, we, you know, we were really limited in, in the conclusions we were able to draw because, okay, 27. I mean, there's a lot of limited statistical power here. And so here we turn to what's called big data. Okay, and, and so today we have over 15 million sequences available on a public repository called GISAID um, and 15.6 million and counting. Okay, literally every week that I enter this database, we find where it increases by more and more. Um, there are labs all over the world that constantly submit sequences here. For, and for a bioinformatician, this is of course wonderful. This is tons of data and this is really amazing. And so the, our idea was that we can search the data and look for something that we call monophyletic clades. And I'll explain what I mean. So this is a phylogenetic tree here. And this is a phylogenetic tree. And this is data taken, for, da taken from a, a paper uh, by Kent and colleagues from 2021. And this is one of the first papers that, that actually reported chronic infections. Now, all the patients that are chronically infected here are, are color coded. OK, so we see the blue sequences here. They're all from the same chronically infected patient. And you see that they all cluster together on the tree, right? They're all together here and separated from the rest of the tree. Same for the green patient. Okay, the purple patient is here. It's kind of hidden a little bit, but it's also, they all cluster together. We have an exception here. The red patient does not cluster together. And that's because of sequencing problems, and I won't be getting into it too much, but that, yes, that's a problem that we have to deal with. We have sequencing issues. But the idea is, is that we assume that a chronically infected individuals will form these monophyletic clades because sequences sampled repeatedly from the same patient will be similar, they will cluster together on the tree, and if there is no honor transmission, then we won't have anything mixed in. So if the blue patient did tra would transmit, then we'd see another sequence coming out of here, and it wouldn't be blue, it would be right, something else. Um, and so, yes, that is a limitation. We're assuming no honor transmission. And so what we're doing is we're mining this huge phylogeny. Um, in our case, it's going to be almost 12 million sequences. We look for sequences. Again, unfortunately, we don't have the data that tells us this is a chronic, chronically infected individual. When people upload their data, they, the data is de-identified. Okay, so the only data we have is the sequence, age, sex, and location. But we're looking for sequences, for a cluster of sequences that has the same age, same sex, same location, and the location is literally uh, to the level of the city, okay, where, where we're sampled from, and with a time interval of more than 21 days, because as I mentioned before, that's our criterion for defining a chronic infection. And our underlying assumption, as I mentioned before, is no under transmission. This means we might be missing um, some cases. We probably are. In fact, we might be missing others because of, these, of this dirty problematic data that I mentioned before, sequencing error. There's a there are a lot of problems that will cause us to miss cases, and we're okay with that. But we do think, as I'll try and convince you, that what we do capture is, is real. And so these are res our results. We found 271 chronic -like clades. Every one of these clades is a, presumably an individual, okay, a chronically infected individual. This is the breakdown of variants that we find, found here. This is the breakdown of countries from where these individuals come from. Um, we don't have any bias here. We were worried that, you know, we might have some bias. We have um, um, kind of like some things that make sense, right? We have more sequences from the USA that makes sense. USA is a country that sequenced a lot. Um, we have more from Europe in general. Again, makes sense. Europe also in general sequenced a lot. But in general, the breakdown may really makes sense. And so to, co to convince you, I'll just show you one example. Um, so we, this is something we did a lot. We looked at a lot of examples. Um, so all of these sequences, which are the green dots here, are from an individual from Slovenia, female, 61 years old. Okay, and so what is the probability that on the tree we'd get someone, you know, so many sequences that are from exactly same age, same sex, and from same location? Very, very low. Um, and in fact, um, this, this case is interesting because it's one of the most divergent cases that we found. There are, 30, there are additional 37 amino acid mutations found on this branch. This is a very, very divergent um, 
um, infection, presumably. Um, and in fact, we, we weren't the only ones that captured it. It was noted by, by the, the, our teams of what's called variant hunters today out in the world that kind of look, are looking for the next variant. They also picked up this case. Um, it was picked up a while ago. Um, and, and there was a lot of concern that this would lead to the next variant. It didn't, okay? Um, but, but this is very, uh, definitely a very interesting case. And, 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 and we, we've, together with others, we look at, we've been looking at it in depth because we see a lot of these spike mutations occurring here and other mutations as well. So are we convinced these are chronic infections in general? So except for looking and staring at these trees, which we've done a lot, how, uh, how, how, how did we become convinced that at least the set is enriched for chronic infections? These are the four lines of evidence that I'll show you. So first of all, the pattern of mutation. This is the same as I showed you before, same type of graph. Again, in these chronic-like clades, which are here, we see this enrichment in the spike protein, okay? And in the control, we don't see it. These are the real cases that we showed before. The bars here look small just because the number of cases, n equal 27, is, is low. Um, the trees are more structured, okay? And so in the chronic-like uh, uh, um, set, so the chronic, that's, that's our term for these clades, chronic-like clades. Uh, the tree is more structured, okay? This is, this is a very structured tree. It looks like a ladder, okay? And this is what we actually expect when a virus is evolving inside a host. That's what HIV looks, HIV trees look like when they evolve inside a host. Whereas we expect the controls to look like this, a star-like topology. Why? Because in, a, in, in corona, as we actually heard in one of the previous talks, there's a lot of super spreading. When you have super spreading, you get this pattern of boom, okay? Like this explosion in the tree. This is like one person who infected a lot of people. And then we can actually measure, measure this and we find something which is called a higher second index and we, we definitely see a higher second index in our chronic-like set. Age and sex, okay. So what we see here is that the chronic-like clades are older and more male. And this is in line with both hematologic cancers, which I mentioned before are the main category. Um, they tend to be more older and more male and it's in line with COVID-19 deterioration. Uh, so we expect to pick up these cases if these are people that are hospitalized. And when they're hospitalized, they can be monitored across time. And so again, this, this makes sense. The rate of evolution. So we see uh, a similar synonymous rate of evolution, which is a proxy for neutral rate of evolution. Whereas we see a higher non-synonymous rate of evolution in our chronic-like set. And this is a marker of adaptive evolution. Okay? So in these patients, again, more mutations in the spike, more non-synonymous mutations in the spike, so mutations that actually alter the amino acid. And so this is, again, evidence that most likely these are really chronic infections. So what have, I, uh, what have we actually sh seen here? We've actually seen um, that, uh, um, and this is something that has been observed before, so chronic infections, what we think is happening here is they speed up the rate of adaptive evolution. Okay, and so as I kind of mentioned before already, they speed up the rate of evolution because of two reasons. One, because the population size of the virus is larger. So we have a lot of viruses in these infected individuals. They don't go through a, tra a transmission bottleneck. So when one person uh, transmits to another person, there's a very stringent transmission bottleneck. Very few viruses are transmitted. That's something that slows down evolution very much. But in the chronically infected patients, we don't have that. So that speeds up evolution, and we have strong selections, the drugs, and the partial immune activity. And this led us to actually ask, so what happens if we actually increase transmission Right? So if we have more, more what we call controls, more transmission chains along the tree, uh, do we actually see the same pattern as in the chronic infections? And so what we, what we did here, what I didn't actually have time to get into much is our control. We, we, we constantly look at a set of controls, which are uh, sequences in the tree which are not the same person, not the same uh, sex. No, so they're transmission chains, they're not chronic infections. So we look at the probability of finding a known adaptive mutation. So we have a set of known adaptive mutations in spike. In our chronic-like set, the probability is 70%. If we look, take an equal size, equal size of controls, the probability is very, very low. When we increase the number of controls by 20, um, we get to that 70%. What am I actually trying to tell you here? Today, there's a zoo of Omicron sub-variants out there, okay? So since BA2 emerged, there's been BA2.38, XBB, XB, you can see there's a zoo of variants. All these zoo of variants actually didn't emerge, didn't likely emerge in chronic infections. They evolved in transmission chains. 
We know that because we see the stepwise. We see the steps. There's one mutation. There's another mutation that's added on. There's another mutation that's been added on. And so once there are enough transmission chains, adaptive evolution happens wonderfully. We don't need those chronic infections anymore. And so that's basically what, what we're seeing here, and that's basically what I'm showing here with these probabilities. Okay, once there are enough transmission chains, the probability of an adaptive mutation occurring is high. Um, all right, so the last bit of my talk is going to be um, about uh, 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 kind of what I call the next generation of bioinformatics. Of course, it's next, but it's kind of old news, right? So one of the biggest challenges that we had in working with this data is that it's hugely noisy. There's a huge lack of consistency in the data. Um, some labs upload their sequences one way. Some labs uh, upload some. I can tell you so many stories about how the data looks like. So, so uh, you know, there's a, there's a, you have to, upload the sex of the, of the patient. So some people say male, some write, write male, some female, some write capital M, some write, some write mujer in Spanish, some write. We get so many different variations about what people upload in the metadata and in the sequence data that it's a horror. And working with an 11.7 million phylogeny is very computationally intensive. And so our solution was actually to resort to something called language models. Language models are what are, are very, became very famous now because ChatGTP is what is, uses these language models. And so basically what we do is we model this, uh, our sequence as a sentence. And the mutations in the genome, the mutations relative to the reference that we work with, are the words in the sentence. And then we can train a model and ask it, you know, learn this language. Tell us what you can find out from this new language, right? And we want to train a classifier that can predict which sentences are derived from chronic-like infection, which sentences are derived from control sequences, normal transmission chains. And so there is a lot of complexity here, and I'm not going to be getting into it. But what we were able to do is, is find the words. And these are the mutations that drive evolution in the different chronic-like clades that we found. And this is just one example. This is BA1. And so um, this. This bit here on the right is what we want to um, uh, look at. These are the mutations that drove the, presumably the chronic-like state in the BA1 infections. Um, we see here a lot of spike mutations. Again, that is expected. And kind of the interesting thing here, and we, we see it here in this little bar here, there are actually quite a lot of mutations that we see not in spike or F1A mutations. We think that they have to do with T cell um, escape, cytotoxic T cell escape. Um, and, and this is a kind of a line of evidence that we're trying to follow up on now. And finally, the last bit of information that I'd like to show you is that what we were able to do is find words that predicts the next variant. So our, uh, uh, what we looked at were only at sequences that were sampled until August 2022. We stopped our, uh, uh, we downloaded all the data on August 2022, and that's what we have. And we are on some of the words that the model predicted as very, very important for being chronic were actually mutations that are present in this zoo of variants that is currently circulating. And these variants only started to circulate in October 2020. And so what we, we basically uh, uh, think is that this model of ours is able to predict the future. These chronic infections are able to predict the net, what, what mutations are going to pop up in um, uh, the population. Um, and so we detected six of the 10 RBD crucial mutations and currently circulating variants. And with that, I'll summarize and just say, first of all, chronic infections are generally rare. Okay, it is important to say they're generally rare, but uh, globally, their absolute number is high. They speed up evolution, um, but perhaps that's only critical when transmission is limited. And so since Omicron came out, there's so much transmission out there that evolution occurs more through transmission chains and less through these variants of concern. Although we never know, we are constantly monitoring and asking ourselves, is it possible that a Delta variant will suddenly come up. So yes, we're seeing Delta chronically, people that are chronically infected with Delta till today, <laughs> okay? And that's kind of worrying. Um, and we think that these chronic infection coupled with these language models can teach us what to predict in the future. And I'll end by really thanking the wonderful team, the two extremely talented graduate students, Sherry Arari and Danielle Miller, who led the study, Dudu Burstein, who's a collaborator, Shai Fleishon from Ministry of Health, and the wonderful team at Ikhilov, uh, and of course the funding, including um, the center that is funding the study. Um, and thank you for your attention. Questions, please. Talia.
Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and convince you that we were able to foresee it, but that's not really true. So like when we started this in, um, about a month ago, we saw a mutation 47A coming up in the spike, and we were like, oh, that's interesting. We see it in a lot of these chronically infected, and now it's come up. Um, so we see the mutations, but we don't, you know, that don't, doesn't always mean anything, or, or not that it doesn't mean. It just means that there will be a variant that will have that mutation, and so far. That doesn't mean anything dramatic. It just means that we'll have another XBB, and it won't be XBB. It's XBB.1.6.2, which with the 478 mutation, which is what we predicted and what we got. More questions? Please. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, the question was about the black box element of the, of the model. I'll say that I actually had a strong objection at first to using the language models exactly because they're a black box and they're very hard to sort of interpret. But there are, that's what we're doing here, right? This lot, what's called Lyme reliability score. We're, we're, uh, we're using, there are new methods that allow explainability from these models and we're utilizing, we're utilizing the, mo the methods to get down to why the model told us that. And that, that's the list of mutations that we find here. Okay, the fact that we're able to say these are the mutations that actually drove the model to say so and so is our is is our ability to add explainability to the model. I have a question, Adi. Um, these immunosuppressed individual uh, clearly the immune system doesn't work properly. So when you say adaptive mutations, why should they adapt? Mm. Oh, okay, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent question. And so um, I hope everyone heard the question. So the question was. If these are immunosuppressed patients and their immune system doesn't work, to what does the virus adapt? It's an excellent question. Actually, our first study really looked at that. So there is, in some, um, in some of these patients, we don't see anything going on. The virus is static. And at first, when we saw this, we were like, what? But this, you know, why, why aren't we seeing, why aren't we expected to see something? Because that's kind of what the theory was saying. Um, but then we realized that that's exactly the point. If the immune system is completely suppressed, we don't see anything. The virus is happy in it, but if it's slightly functioning, as long as there's some slight function of the immune system, it's driving the virus to change, um, whether it's the T cell arm or the B cell arm or the treatments that they're receiving, which are also driving the virus to change. If they're receiving monoclonal antibodies, what we'll see is mutations that escape the monoclonal antibodies, and we see that very strongly here. This mutation here, S304D, is a mutation that escapes otrovimab, which is a monoclonal antibody. So, so we're seeing that as well. We're seeing everything. For, so if we talk about controls, which are not immunosuppressed, we would see the most adaptive um, pressure on the virus because the immune system there is the most functional. But it's so functional that it clears the virus. The virus doesn't have enough time to escape. Okay. And, and people that are intact, the immune system is intact, we do, there's no time. The virus is cleared in like, what, two weeks? There's no time for, for the virus to escape. But it's partially, that's kind of like follows, it's partially immunosuppressed. It's an excellent question. And so, yes, I think that's why most of them, in most cases, there's no transmission. I think in most cases, there's no transmission because there's a fitness cost associated with those. Um, um, and, and, and it's interesting because, so the, in the rare cases where we do see transmission, what are those cases? The variants of concern. So some of them are, for, so Omicron itself, there have been reversions of some of the mutations as it evolved. So from BA1 to BA2, there were some mutations that were lost. And presumably those are ones that had fitness costs and it kind of fixed itself. Okay, thank you, Adi. Thank you. Thank you.